And good evening, everyone. Well, or good morning, depending on where you are. <laughs> Welcome to Trolling World Logic. It's 7 p.m. in the UK, and I think it's 6 a.m. with our guest right now. So, in advance, a very big thank you for him to getting up so early for this. Uh, so we're a thank you. weekly uh, secular skeptic show, and broadcasting here on Google Hangouts. Uh, just a few quick announcements. You can call in at any time. Just send us a Skype contact request to Trolling World Logic. A little p.m. with a just to your question, and we'll add you on in due course. Also, the show is recorded and uploaded later, so if you call in, please bear in mind you're granting us permission to use your likeness, so please no funny legal stuff when the show is uploaded. Also, the recording of this show is public domain, so feel free to copy, share, distribute, and spread it around any way you want, just as long as you link back to us as a courtesy. And with me today is a very much reduced panel, so I was just my one and only co-host, Sheila. Welcome. Thanks, Cal. Glad to be here again. No problem. So I'll quickly introduce our guest today. He is an Australian writer, philosopher, critic, um, currently based in Newcastle, and I'm not too sure what state that's in, so please uh, apologies for that. Uh, you'll probably know him from his books, uh, Freedom from Religion, The Secular State, 50 Greatest and the 50 greatest myths about atheism, and he has just, uh, I, just I think just weeks ago, released a new book called Humanity Enhanced Genetic Choice and the Challenge for Liberal Democracies, and I think also called, uh, just recently got a PhD in bioethics, so a man of many talents. Please welcome <laughs> Russell Blackford to the show. <laughs> Thanks, Cal. Um, for your information, Newcastle is in New South Wales. It's ah, just right. a little bit north of Sydney. All ah, right, cool. Uh, yeah, anyway. So I think, Take as is the custom, um, Sheila seems to be the, the best with all the introductory <laughs> questions. So, as always, I'll hand over to Sheila to get us started. Okay. Um, I guess uh, since bioethics seems to be what we're talking about today, how did you get uh, interested in, in that sort of a field? Uh, look, I've had an interest in the, you know, the human future for a very long time. The PhD, strictly speaking, is actually in philosophy, not in bioethics. It's really uh, partly philosophical bioethics, but partly philosophy of law. And what particularly interested me in the particular case of the PhD, leaving aside the larger issues of bioethics, was what I saw as a moral panic about the issues that it deals with, you know, when um, the announcement was made in the journal Nature in early 1997 about the cloning of Dolly the Sheep, if you recall, there was an enormous amount of discussion in the public sphere, uh, a great deal of which was, you know, repugnance, horror, fear that this sort of technology could be used to create, you know, human babies, right? Now, I thought all of that was misplaced, not, not only because it might have turned out to be difficult to do it, which we didn't necessarily know at that time, but that did turn out to be the case, but there just seemed to be, to be no real basis in our ordinary understanding of you know, what sort of things we should be fearing, what sort of things we should be regulating by law. So there seemed to be no basis for this kind of repugnance, fear, the sort of legal prohibitions that were put in place and so on. It, it seemed to me that what we were seeing here was a, a kind of challenge to our normal ideas of liberal tolerance and we were failing that challenge. You know, we were going down this route of moral panic and knee-jerk legislation instead. So that fits into a, you know, a much wider interest that I have in in politics, in political philosophy, political theory, but I am also interested in the human future. I've, I've for example, always been an avid reader of, of science fiction. I've written some science fiction professionally. So that that kind of area at the intersection of bioethics and philosophy of law and political philosophy, you know, was of interest to me because a whole lot of my interests converged in that area. Do you find a lot of, uh, oh, like a lot of the science fiction is uh, even loosely based somewhat in reality when it comes to the uh, the ethics of? Um uh, look, it, it, it varies enormously. I mean, there are some serious works that yeah you know, that, that deal with this 
this kind of issue in a way that I think is very you know, useful and, and thought-provoking. We have to remember, though, that a lot of science fiction is really an excuse for you know, exotic adventures in, you know, in exotic locales in space and, and time. So, so a lot of science fiction, you, you might say, can't be taken all that seriously. Yeah, even as a literature of ideas, but but the overall genre, yes, it is a literature of ideas. You know, it it buzzes with intellectual excitement. I'm I'm talking here more of the written science fiction rather than, you know, cinema or, or television. But you know, there, there is a literature of ideas there, and sure, um, some of it is useful. But but this this set of issues does merit yeah some hard nosed. I don't know, yeah. Skeptical scrutiny. Skeptical in the sense of being skeptical about these, these sort of knee-jerk reactions, these, these highly emotional reactions that we often see. Well, right, and I, I find that um, a lot of times Hollywood will kind of contribute to that. You know, when the, when the cloning yeah. issue was big, we had movies like The Sixth Day raising issues about, uh, yeah. you know, yeah. morals uh, of cloning people and, you know, and stuff like that, so... And, and movies like that often seem to me to just fear mongering, you know. I mean, I mean that was an amusing movie. <laughs> and at the end, they, they, they do actually clone the dog at the end, don't they? I, I'm trying to remember how that movie ends up. Yeah. But, but, but throughout, it, it's partly an excuse for, you know, some weird adventure going on. <laughs> um, partly, it's the, the sort of fear mongering going on. I guess you don't take a movie like that too seriously, but the cumulative impact of a lot of movies like that is to add to that general climate of fear, which you know I'm, I'm obviously speaking against. Right. Do you uh, see us going in the direction of, uh, you know, we were talking about Dolly and the cloning before, do you see that being a, a legitimate possibility for future? Uh, in theory, I, 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 I say in the book that we need to have a reality check with a lot of this stuff. You know, the, the fact is that it has proven very difficult to clone primates. You know, back in 1997, the sky seemed to be the limit, but he, what is it now? 16, well, since Stoll was actually cloned, um, 17 years later, right? Yeah. And we're still not very far advanced towards human reproductive cloning and there's no real prospect of it on the horizon. So reality check is pretty important. Let, let's see you know, what kind of pace of change we're really talking about. Now, now all that said, there are uses of you know, the somatic cell nuclear transfer technique, the technique used to create Dolly, you know, which could be highly beneficial not in creating babies but in creating, creating therapies, you know, researching um, you know, medical issues. Yes, we're talking here about so-called therapeutic cloning as opposed to reproductive cloning. And that is potentially very useful. I mean, if, if you could clone uh, you know, organs which match the genome of the patient, so there's you know, no issue about tissue rejection, you know, that is a great medical breakthrough. And that kind of research, I think, is very important. There's been a you know, backlash even against that kind of research and where it is allowed at all, uh, it's allowed only with very stringent regulation because of the fear that surrounds this whole set of issues. Well, yeah, people are freaking out about cloning fruit. <laughs> so, well, okay. you know, well, <laughs> something we've been doing for a very long time. Right, right. So, yeah, I, I think... Uh, I, I guess it's I, it doesn't really make any sense, but it's understandable that people would freak out about cloning specific organs and stuff like that. I guess. Yeah. Well, and there's also the whole thing about the rights of the embryo. You know, you this this kind of research is going to you know re require destroying embryos. A lot of people think that embryos are sacred because they're yeah you know, they they possess human dignity or something. Yeah, you know, they're they like little human beings, even though they they obviously don't possess consciousness or, or or anything like that, or personhood in the sense of having some kind of sense of themselves. Right. But, but but nonetheless, there is this view that they possess some kind of enormous moral worth and must not be damaged or or destroyed. Or you know, you, you know, if you do that, you know, you know, if you deliberately destroy even a tiny eight cell. Uh, embryo, then you're doing something that's morally very wrong. 
Uh, and, and that'll come across often from religious morality, but not, not just from religious morality. You know, a, a lot of people do, even from some kind of point of view that they claim is secular, think that human life, even in that form, has a kind of you know, sanctity that, you know, that you mustn't violate. So a whole lot of issues get caught up with this. You know, religious morality, just fears about the future, fears about tampering you know, with the, you know, the order of nature. And it becomes a very emotional debate and leads to a lot of, I, I think, bad and um, you know, knee-jerk public policy. Um, I've got a question. It's a little bit off track, and it's just that you know I had a look through your bibliography, and I saw that you did uh, tie-in books for the Terminator franchise. I did, yeah. Yeah. Um, I know that it's going to sound like a little bit of a bizarre question, but well, how did that compare to like writing a scientific paper? Because as I understand, like I've spoken to some authors, she's done expanded universe, and like yeah. it's very strict set of rules, and the feedback can be quite, uh, I don't know, vociferous. I mean, was there a similarity? Did you find? Uh, look, it's a very different experience writing yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, you, you're right that there's a kind of rigour about it. Uh, I prepared a, you know, a, a pitch, a detailed prospectus of the three books, and I went deeply into the way the two movies at that time it was, and, and um, Terminator 3 hadn't yet come out at that point, but I went deeply into how those work, the time travel theory, and you know, how you could make sense of the two movies which seem to run with different theories about how how time travel works, you know, what might happen afterwards given that kind of rationalisation, etc, etc. So there is a kind of rigour and I, I watched oh, both movies you know, quite a few times, Terminator 2 to which the three books were a direct sequel, I studied very, very closely. Yeah. So yes, there's a rigour to it, but the way of writing for me is very, very different. Yeah. If I'm writing fiction, I am writing through the characters. You know, I'm immersed in the sensorium, the thoughts, the you know what's seen, what's heard, you know, by the viewpoint character that I'm using, and it's a it's. It's a funny thing to explain to someone who hasn't sort of written fiction at a professional level how you, you know, are taught to do it or teach yourself to do it. Uh, it, it is a, a kind of immersion in the characters that you're creating and using in that way. That is a very different thing from writing something like a philosophical yeah. paper. Yeah, that has a rigour, of course, but it, it's. I just find it's a very different mental zone to be in, and I've said often that I cannot be doing both at the same time. You know, I could be right. juggling more than one um, you know, a philosophical project. I can maybe even be writing a short story while I'm writing a novel. I, uh, but, but what I cannot be doing is writing some work of fiction while at the same time I'm on, on a, uh, an immersive non-fiction project. They are very, just very different zones. But yeah, they, bo they both have, each has a kind of rigour. Of its own. Yeah. Um, and what? How did the feedback to the two compare? Like, say, like your philosophical peers compared to Terminator fans? Right? <laughs> Were they both? Well, the only thing I did at this much overlap. Yeah. Uh, look, you don't necessarily get a huge lot of feedback from either. In, in a way, I mean, unless you're Neil Gaiman or somebody, you're not getting constant feedback from fans. You know, a, a lot of people write fiction, and it doesn't reach a vast audience. The Terminator books. Did actually reach quite a large audience, but they didn't receive huge numbers of reviews. If you went to Amazon, you'd find there's quite a few reviews there, and they tended to be quite favourable. Right. Uh, I I received certain amount of fan mail, which is nice. <laughs> uh, I still get the occasional inquiry about the Terminator books, but yeah, it's not like you're receiving you know, an enormous amount of feedback unless you become a real celebrity author. Okay. With something like you know, Fifty Great Myths About Atheism, you know, so so a book that's aimed at at this kind of movement, yeah, you know, to some extent it's aimed at that movement. Yeah, you do get a fair bit of feedback. You find yourself caught up in debates, um, and again, I suppose the feedback that I have had for that book and for uh, Fifty Voices of Disbelief, the book that Dujo Shuklank and I edited a few years ago, that feedback's been pretty positive. But again, it's not as if there's been some huge number of reviews. You know, there's been quite a few reviews on Amazon by now, 50 Voices of Disbelief, which came out in 2009. Uh, and again, that's been pretty favourable. Uh, it's opened doors. But 
yeah, not a lot of reviews in newspapers. Some in some in academic journals actually, um, and they've generally been pretty favourable. So I don't know how you do that comparison. All right, so. but but. <laughs> You know, that, that, I'm, I'm giving you a very long answer. But, yeah, all right. But, you know, it, it, it's it's complicated. But you do get a certain amount of feedback. Unfortunately, the the feedback I've had has tended to be pretty favourable so far. Tended to be. I could give you some stories all right. uh, that go against that tendency. <laughs> all right, I'll hand over back over to Sheila there. What's been your, uh, I guess, your more favourite uh, genre to kind of write in? Are you enjoying doing the more uh, non-fiction? Uh, reality-based sort of stuff, or or do you really enjoy yeah. doing the sci-fi stuff better? I do feel like uh, what I'm doing now is what I should be doing. I, I you know, I said to someone that I, I feel like I've been studying all my life to write the books I'm currently writing, <laughs> and, and and I'm finally in a position where I can do them. You know, I've, I've finally built up you know, enough of a reputation and enough. Um, Financial independence, because these books don't make huge amounts of money. Right. You know, to be able to do this, and I hope to keep on doing it. I, you know, I think I am writing about topics that are important, and you know, doing them in a scholarly way that you know, again has some some rigor about it. So I'm so I'm very happy doing this. I was pretty happy writing those media time books, but that that opportunity it came out of left field, and it was a lot of fun at the time. But it's not something I really expected was going to happen, and it's not something that I particularly regret that I'm not not doing. Uh, it, it's a very tight market doing that sort of work. It would be hard for me to get back into that market, but that doesn't particularly bother me. And I have no other great ambitions as far as writing fiction go. I don't think I'm the sort of person that's a natural storyteller who's got you know, huge numbers of stories that are just bursting to come out, which I think you have to be to make a success of being a fiction writer. What I do think I can do is I, I think I can write quite well, I think I can create vivid scenes, I think I can get in the minds of characters. Um, I'm fairly proud of the work that I've done uh, in that area, but I think what I'm doing now is what I really should be doing. Right, excellent. Um, that, that's it, I'm actually working on a on a project, uh, but, but a project, a very old project that is not come to fruition yet and I'm tinkering with around the edges with some other people. I, I don't really want to talk about that today but uh, having said all that I've just said, uh, this this little book uh, will come out from a small press probably next year and, and so you'll see a book, uh, you know, a work of fiction that I've had some input into but that's a collaborative novel and it's a very different thing you know, and, and it's a bit of fun, it's not really the main thing that I'm doing with my life. A collaborative novel with other writers? Yeah. Oh, yeah. excellent. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, cool. As I say, from my point of view, a bit of fun because it's something that a bunch of other people started collaborating on a long time ago and some of those people are now dead. But the book has never been you know, fully developed until now. Uh, a number of people have had, as I say, input into it to, you know, to expand it, to, to develop it. And I expect now that it will actually be... Um, Coming out here in Australia uh, next year, but but that's that's a relatively small project from my point of view. Just a bit of fun. Uh, it's a it's a funny book, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and and I'll, and I'll be promoting that next year. But it, but it's not the main thing I'm doing in my life. You know, the main thing really is these uh, philosophical uh, and related books I'm writing, uh, co-writing with Udo, you know, editing, co-editing, and so on. All right, uh, I. Like I said, I did have some, like I said before, so um, Kitch couldn't make it tonight. Uh, he apologizes to everyone, but he did leave me some questions for Russell. Um, the first one he's asking is, there are some scientists who see bioethics as just another layer of paperwork <laughs> to their overall work. Uh, why is this, and why is bioethics so important? Oh, well, I mean, <laughs> the second bit's a very large question, but I can, I can understand if... Uh, some medical research scientists, for example, see bioethics as, a, as an impediment to what they're doing. Uh, and, and one reason for that is that there are all these different inputs into bioethics, you know, religious morality, you know, 
fears about the future and so on, which have led to a lot of restrictions in my view are not justifiable. So, so yes, in, in some cases it is an unnecessary layer of, of bureaucracy going on there. Now that said, from a larger point of view, bioethics is important. I'd probably have to give a whole lecture on, on why that's so, but if you think back to some of the abuses that have taken place in medical research, uh, in well, I mean, there are some very famous ones in the last decades of the last century. Uh, it, it, it does seem to show that if doctors are just left to regulate themselves, some of those doctors will behave in quite unscrupulous ways to get the results that, you know, that, that, that they're seeking. And so it was necessary, partly in response to what was going on in Nazi Germany, but partly in response to what was going on in much more civilised places like you know, the United States and New Zealand. You, you can drag out these horror stories of how uh, patients were, you know, were abused in medical research. You know, it was necessary to have a body of regulation of that and so principles were developed, um, you know, et ethical guidelines were put in place, a bureaucracy was put in place and I, I don't think anyone can deny that it was important you know, to do that, to have those, you know, those legal and semi-legal instruments, you know, to have some sort of bureaucracy to enforce them, etc, etc. Now, of course, many medical research scientists would never dream of those abuses. Abuses that in some cases meant not telling people that they had diseases. Um, you know, large numbers of people in quite coercive situations uh, being, you know, being required to take part in you know, large-scale um, programs of experiments and observations, etc. You know, of course, many people would never think of doing that, but some do. And and abuses still go on. You know, there there are still some cases around that are highly controversial. Uh, in the developing world, you know, we see a lot of drug trials taking place in ways that are very ethically dubious. And you know, if, if we didn't have uh, you know bioethics infrastructure there, that would be even more so because there would be no regulation on it. And and on and on and on. So so it has been necessary to yeah you know, to regulate. Um, experimentation on on human beings, and yeah, and and the and the treatment of human beings, and the ability of you know medical researchers just to do what they want. It, it it is important, but it must not be used in a way that's not rational. Okay, um, Sheila, do you have anything to follow up on there? Uh, no, go ahead. Okay, uh, we did get another question. Just came in via PM. Um, it's from Paul Sanderson. Uh, He's asking, out of the 50 myths of atheism, which is your favourite, as in the one that makes you laugh the most? <laughs> oh, the atheists have no sense of humour is probably the funniest one. <laughs> 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 but, but, I mean, it's a real myth. Yeah, you, you actually do see people say, oh, yeah, these atheists have no... Yeah. Often in the fraught environment in the United States over... Yeah, the, the, the culture wars there, the debates about religion and its public role, all kinds of things get said about atheists in that environment that you know, might not be said, say, in my country. But, but yeah, we found examples of all these really crazy myths. Uh, but yeah, some of them are very serious as well. You, you ask me what's my favourite, that's, that's probably the most amusing one that immediately comes to mind. I keep glancing over at the book as I try to <laughs> inspire myself. But you know, some of these myths are very serious. Aether is continually associated with you know, the evils of yeah. you know, the, the, the Soviet Union and um, you know, Cambodia or Cambodia under Pol Pot and Maoism and the enormous loss of life that took place under that regime. And yeah, you know, it's amazing. There was this Cold War mentality in the US that associated the Soviet Union with atheism, which was right up to a point. But it, it went the other way. That all atheists, you know, are, are communists, and they're yes, you know, undermining our democratic society. They're undermining our freedoms, etc. Et that has been very powerful, 
and you know, it continues to be dragged out all, you know, all the time in debates about the merits or otherwise of atheists by people who are hostile to atheism. So some of these things really are very serious and, and, and of course just the arguments about science and the relationship between science and religion which we talk a lot about in the book is you know, philosophically very important and, and socially important. I think people like to associate anything they don't fully understand or agree with with communism. I think that's that's probably why we get lumped yeah. in with it so often. Yeah. Or Nazism, you know, one of the myths that we deal with in the book is the claim that Hitler was an atheist. Now we delve into that. Did Hitler believe in God? What was his relationship with Orthodox Christianity? Because he was, he never actually left the Catholic Church. But you know, he does. It does seem that his belief in God was probably pretty unorthodox by the end. But there's no evidence that he was ever an atheist. At the most, you might be able to argue that he was some kind of deist. He might have believed in some kind of impersonal God or providence. That that that's arguable. But the the argument that he was an atheist really won't wash. But but yeah, Hitler, Stalin, Mao, all, all this comes up all the time. Yeah. Um, how did you collate the 50 um, myths? Was it, did you just go speaking to people or was it through browsing forums or something like that? A lot of it was just brainstorming between myself and Dudo. Okay. Uh, I mean, when the book was originally suggested by our commissioning editor uh, that yeah, maybe it would be worthwhile doing a book on, on of myths about atheism. Uh, he had been has not directly involved, but, but at Wiley Blackwell, um, Jeff Dean, our commissioning editor, would have had some involvement with a book called 50 Great Myths of Popular Psychology, which did well for Wiley Blackwell. And they're thinking, oh, yeah, we're going to do other books about you know, myths in, in various areas. It seems something that the public you know, is receptive to. So he approached us. Um, yeah, maybe you could do a book of myths about atheism because we'd done 50 voices of disbelief for Wiley Blackwell. And we thought, well, you know, I wonder how many of these myths there are. He's saying maybe there aren't 50, maybe 30 books, 30 <laughs> myths about atheism, or 10 or 15 or however many there turn out to be. But we brainstormed. And it seemed to us, having been very involved in these debates, over the last few years that there probably were quite a lot. We also wrote out to a, a lot of individuals who we knew who were also involved in the debates and asked them for their favourite myths about atheism. We got quite a bit of feedback. Uh, yeah, we, we generally trawled uh, for these myths. A, a lot of people came up with myths that we already had come up with ourselves, but some came up with new ones. And yeah, we were able, with a bit of stretching of the point, to come to a nice number of, of 50. So it's, so it's as simple as that. It wasn't done in any scientific way, uh, but it was a lot, of, a lot of brainstorming and a lot of getting feedback from people. Right. While you were doing that, did you happen to come up with, I mean, did you, were you able to come up with enough fodder for a possibility of another book, or is that pretty much where you're going to leave it at this point? I. I think it's more likely that we would do a book with a title like More Voices of Disbelief, actually. Uh, if I were to do a sequel to 50 Great Myths About Atheism, and, and it, it probably would be me rather than Udo wanting to be involved, although who knows, maybe we'd do another book together. But I, I'd more likely want to write a book about uh, atheism, religion, and science, you know, really focusing hard on those issues because I think there's a, a very important uh, issue to discuss there in more depth. I don't think I'd be particularly just doing you know, more bits about atheism <laughs> or something. Right. But when Udo and I brought out 50 Voices of Disbelief, um, you know, back in 2009, as I said, we both found ourselves talking to a lot of people saying, oh, well, you know, I would have liked to be involved in that book. <laughs> and, I, and I think we could actually do 50 more voices of, of disbelief or, or just more voices of disbelief or something along those lines, you know, if we found ourselves with the um, time clear to do that at some point. You know, a lot of people want to tell their story about why they reject religion, why they don't believe in a god or, or anything supernatural, which is pretty much what 50 Voices of Disbelief is. You know, it's 50 essays 
uh, by, by people telling that story, sometimes in a very biographical way, sometimes in a more stand back and let's be you know, philosophically detached way. But, but 50 people, or I think a total of 52 involved, but a couple of co authored pieces, uh, 50 <laughs> essays saying, you know, basically why we don't believe in God or why we don't accept religion. Well, there's a lot more stories, and there, there seemed to be a bit of a hunger for that book. You know that yeah. that book was pretty successful. Uh, a lot of people really enjoyed reading those very varied accounts. So, so I think that's the more likely book that Udo and I would uh, do together as a sequel now. But maybe Udo will tell you a different story. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't I haven't asked him. <laughs> what I just said. Right. Right. Gotcha. Okay, um, there's another question that Kitch left with us, and he's asking about one of the papers you've written, and it's about the rights of a fetus, where you used oh, yeah. another world uh, analogy. Analogy, sorry. Uh, yeah. He's just wanting to know where you came up with the idea for that. Oh, that's a hard question, you know, because I think it's just, I was just trying to think in my mind, you know, why. Do we attribute these kind of you know, moral rights and moral status to to the embryo? I, I I don't know where ideas come from. You know, they well up from the subconscious or whatever. We're not consciously in control of them. And that could be a whole other story about your know, free will and all those kind of issues. But I, but I was just trying to sort out how to explain how I saw it. This whole story about you know, the what I call them, the ovoids, I think I called them, or whatever I called them this, uh, on this world, to make sense of how I was reasoning about it. And it, and it kind of grew and grew and grew. <laughs> the, the, the little story ended up swallowing the, the whole essay, or most of the essay. But, but that was also a bit of fun, and I, and I think the essay did actually do uh, you know, a reasonably good job of explaining why it doesn't really make sense to attribute rights to the fetus and why that is consistent with the kind of solicitude that we show towards uh, you know, very young babies. You, know, you, you, you might think that there's a, a contradiction there. You, know, you, you might think, well, at the point of birth, you know, the intrinsic characteristics of the, you know, the, the organism we're talking about don't, don't especially change. So if we're prepared to countenance you know, abortion, say, um, why aren't we prepared to countenance infanticide? Now, there's a quite complex story about that, I think. But, um, you know, I think I was able to illustrate you know, some of my thinking about that complex story um, you know, by, by telling that little fable about stem cell research in other worlds. Of, of course, a whole lot of issues get caught up. Yeah, stem cell research, we're dealing with tiny, very new embryos, you know, generally speaking we're talking about eight cell blastocysts here, uh, versus talking about a, you know, a late fetus, you know, fetus during the late stages of pregnancy, versus again what you say about a newborn baby. And to be able to tell a sensible story about you know, what sort of moral rights we should ascribe to all those different entities and why you know, it's appropriate to have protections of um, newborn babies, but why we should be very reticent about um, you know, banning abortions. You know, that, that's not a simple thing. I, I think in the end the position is fairly clear, but it's not a fi I don't think it's a simple issue and it's not surprising to me that you know, that set of issues has been debated on and on for many years. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, what, is there a real abortion debate in Australia? Uh, because in like I said, I've just got no idea what it's like. Is there a oh uh, yeah, there still is around the edges, and there's still attempts by conservative governments to push back you know, women's reproductive rights. So yes, it, go, it does it does go on. Now that said, uh, you know, abortion is fairly accepted here in Australia, but but still, there are anti-abortion activists. There are you know, strands within our governments that are anti-abortion, and there are ebbs and flows yeah. in just what the public policy is. Yeah. Sheila, I'll hand over to you now. <laughs> well, it's, it's something you said earlier kind of, uh, you know, s sparked something a little bit. Um, we said something about free will. What a, you know, how much do we really know about it? What if it is just subconscious 
uh, fragments picked up from things that we do every day? You know, uh, how much are we actually responsible for the things that we that we claim are free will? You know, and how much of it is just yeah. absorbing stuff from everywhere else? It's terribly difficult. Yeah, a lot of people seem to think that they know the answer to the free will question, and I don't think anyone knows the answer to it. And and I think and, and the reason for that isn't anything spooky and metaphysical. It's merely that I think a lot of these concepts that are very important to you know, to, to ordinary human beings, uh, you know, concepts like living free will over a second, concepts like justice and morality, but but also concepts like you know, fate and free will. What do these concepts even mean? You know, once you start digging into those concepts in a rigorous way, they often start to fall apart. It often becomes very unclear what they even mean. They're they're vague. They're often incoherent. There's often more than one concept that seems that's that's going on there, and it can be very difficult trying to sort out what's really really bugging people. People now, people historically, when they use this sort of language. So that's why I think it's it's difficult. We, we may be able to establish scientifically what's actually going on, but what it really means compared to our concepts may be really quite hard. What it tells us about how to live a, you know, a, a life of practical wisdom yeah, may be quite hard because we may not be able to pin down the concepts in the first place. You go way, way back to those yeah, you know, those dialogues of Plato, when you see Socrates in those dialogues trying to nail down, you know, what do you mean by justice? What do you mean by this concept? What do you mean by that concept? And it it really starts to fall apart under any you know, really rigorous scrutiny. So coming back to free will, well, someone like um, Sam Harris, who I've uh, yeah, cross swords with in a you know in a very civil way I must say, <laughs> but but yeah we have had debates about some of these issues. I, I think where some of these people go wrong is they think I know just what free will means. I know just what that concept means, and knowing what that means, I can then tell you whether we possess that faculty or not. I think that's the wrong way to approach it. I, I don't think we really know. Uh, precisely what people mean by free will. I think people mean different things by it. Uh, it depends upon you know, your precise life experience in which you've encountered such a such a vague, potentially incoherent term. And there are going to be all sorts of strands of what's really bugging people when they talk about free will. And the the language can be misleading. I think it'd be misleading to say we have free will. I think it'd be misleading to say we don't have free will because it can give the wrong impression to people depending upon what's really worrying them. So I, I think that's really hard and we have to be, again, you know, rigorous and disciplined and, and, and open to different views and very patient in trying to sort out what's really going on here. But I do think that Sam is quite correct when he says that we are not in sort of conscious control of of our decisions, you know, there's always a whole lot going on there that just that, that just comes to us. You know, it, it's happening at some subconscious level. That I I can't consciously decide that I will come up with a certain thought experiment to explain some concept. Right? It, it just doesn't happen that way. And you know, ultimately, we are part of nature. Ultimately, we are a product of a more or less deterministic process, more or less deterministic, of course, you can talk about quantum effects, etc., etc. And if someone has a concept of free will that denies that, then I'd say we do not have free will in that sense, right? But that doesn't mean that we don't have any efficacy in shaping our own futures, for example. Uh, if, if that's what's really bugging people, I think that often is what's really bugging people, then I think it's misleading to say you don't have free will because that will be received as meaning somehow it's futile for me to plan my life. Well, no, it's not futile for you to plan your life. So I'm, I'm sketching things here, but it's still giving a long answer. I, I think it is complicated. Well, it is complicated, and I think, I think your answer, uh, although long, um, it was just fine. I think it, it kind of answered what I... Or what I was intending in the first place. So, 
Very good. <laughs> well, it's <a> relief. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> but I hope all the people out there will say the same thing. But, but <laughs> I, unfortunately, I'm going to end up giving long answers to a lot of these questions because I think in a lot of cases, it actually, it actually is complicated. You can say some things uh, with confidence, but other things you can't even be confident what, what really is bugging people, and I think often those people themselves would find it hard to define what's what's really bugging them, you know, and, and trying to sort that out with people is a large part of philosophy. Um, just on the on the subject of philosophy there, um, I think it's quite fair to say like philosophy does have a bad image at the moment. Uh, uh, you know, like just in every day, like a lot of people imagine, you know, philosophers, they're just, you know, sitting yeah. around their head, you know, heads in the clouds all the time and a lot of people are turned off by it. I mean, do you feel that as well? And do you think philosophers could be doing a bit more to be engaging the public and getting them interested in the subject? Uh, well, look, in answer to the, the second question, yes, of course, I, I, I do think that. Um, I mean, the, the books that I've been writing and editing are meant to be, I keep using the word rigorous today for some reason, but, but they are meant to be rigorous. They're meant to be rigorous, they're meant to be scholarly, but they are also meant to be accessible to a pretty broad public, right? And and I do think it's important to be writing those sorts of books and not to be just writing very um, highly technical work that gets published in peer-reviewed journals to be read only by other philosophers. So I think it's important to be writing those sorts of books and possibly writing books at an even more popular level. So yes, the, the, the simple answer to your second question is yes. But, but as for the image of philosophers, I, I don't know what the image of philosophers really is. It's, it's only since I've been so involved in you know, the, you know, this atheist movement that seems to have grown up in the last five or ten years that I've seen so much flack directed at philosophers. And, and a lot of that flack does seem to come from people who are very impatient with philosophy, uh, who think that they can come in and discuss these sorts of questions and solve the problems you know, very easily without doing the, you know, the the patient, detailed work. And I think that's a pity. Uh, I, I, th I think they're missing out on something, that they're not, they're not really being patient enough to delve into culture and history and mythology and, and just the, the kind of discourse that philosophers engage in among themselves, you know, really trying to nail concepts down. And that is something important they're missing out on. Of, of course you can give some kind of scientific answer to how you know, the brain might be working or whatever, but that's, that's not necessarily going to tell you what's really bugging people when they talk about free will. You, know? you, you, you just do have to have that patience to try to find what is really underlying these kind of concerns, this kind of talk. And that's not easy, but it's but it's valuable to engage in that exercise. So so it's so it's unfortunate I think that we see some yeah, some flack even from people that I respect and like. Yeah, you know, people like Lawrence Krauss, um, you know, I, I see it from other people who I respect and like, a kind of impatience uh, with philosophy. Uh, please be a bit more patient with what's really going on, with what philosophers are, are really on about. But, but yes, we do ourselves a disservice as well by not being prepared to engage with the public in a way that's accessible. Okay, um, we'll go back to Sheila. <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, I had a question too. Oh, um, um, we can come back to you, Sheila, because like I say, I've got Kitch's questions. He gave me a whole raft of them. Uh, Kitch's next question was on human cloning. If it were perfected yeah. so that the clones could live just as long um, and with no consequences, what ethical issues would arise and would clones question their own identity? Yeah, I don't see why clones would question their own identity any more than anybody else does. I mean, we're, we're all products of a pretty much um, chance outcome where you know, certain genes have come together from you know, a, a male and a female germ cell, um, but we are products nonetheless of the genetic makeups of our parents. If I were the product of the genetic makeup of just one person, 
Well, I'm not sure why that's necessarily going to make me question my identity. You know, it's, it's pretty clear what my genetic identity is, right? The, the greater fear, I think, is that clones will be looked upon by society as freaks in some way and, and will be subjected to, you know, to prejudices and to stigma. I think that is a real fear. That could happen. And we might get over it eventually, but that, that could certainly happen. And it might well be a reason why I, as a particular individual, may not want to create a clone of myself because I might be laying out some real problems for that person if they become subject, subjected to that sort of stigma and prejudice. Um, it's just, just this is my own question. Uh, you know, I've kind of got a, my grasp of cloning is from science fiction. So, is, okay. a, is a clone an actual complete hundred percent copy of someone, or is it? Have they, is it saying a little bit different than that? Oh, uh, it's it's almost complete because the nuclear DNA, the the DNA in the nucleus of the cell, uh, is is replicated. Right now, now that said, the clone will grow up in a different environment, even a different um, environment prior to birth, let alone after. birth. Birth, and so those environmental influences are going to produce someone who's very different in all sorts of ways. But uh, a, a, a human being, let's say, created through the somatic cell nuclear transfer technique, will be almost a genetic um, copy of the original, almost because there's mitochondrial DNA as well that um, yeah, will not come from the, the nucleus of the... Um, of the cell, but that almost a genetic copy. Uh, j just to, <laughs> it's early in the morning here, so I'm still <laughs> thinking in a slightly fuzzy way, but if we, if we go back to how the somatic cell nuclear transfer um, process works, what you're really doing is you're taking an ordinary cell, not a germ cell, so not a sperm cell or you know, an egg cell, an ovum, just an ordinary cell, which might be a skin cell or whatever it might be, and you are taking the DNA from the nucleus of that cell and that will be the DNA of the new human being or sheep or whatever it is, right? So the, the DNA of, of Dolly is the nuclear DNA that came from, in this case, a mammary cell of a pre-existing sheep. Okay. All right, uh, Sheila, do you have your question now? Yeah, well, uh, this is just more tied into what he was just saying. Yeah. Um, you know, th about uh, whether or not people would accept uh, uh, clones as real people. It seems to me that back when, um, at that time, was referred to as test tube babies, kind of went yeah. through the same issue, you know, uh, as they grew up and it was discovered that they were... Uh, you know, originally yeah. created in a in a petri dish as opposed to the old-fashioned way, I suppose. And you know, at, I guess at this stage, people have pretty much just accepted it as another way that people are made. You know, for, for those. So I think, although you know, should we ever, for whatever reason, and you know, with the seven billion people on the planet, I don't see any reason to need to clone. But should we ever get around to that <laughs> stage? I think that. You know, it may start out that they might be seen as freaks or something, but eventually they would just be accepted as, you know, the same way that that uh, you know embryos that are created in a lab are now. Look, I think that's probably right. But if you find yourself early in that social process, you might still hesitate because you might think, well, my child will be the child that suffers from this you know, stigma and, and prejudice and so on. So, so at that level of individuals making decisions, you, you might very well hesitate. But if you, as an individual, again, live in a social milieu where you think that's not going to happen, then for you as an individual, you, know, you, you might be happy enough to go ahead. It, it's going to vary very much on the setting of, of the individual. But I think that is the thing that... that, that is what the cloned offspring, you know, the, the child who's been cloned this way, probably has most to fear, you know, the social response. I, I don't think it's going to be so much some deep existential crisis about, well, who am I really? 
any more than other children who come into existence in all sorts of ways and circumstances. You know, have that kind of crisis. You know, I, I don't think that would necessarily happen. And you know, if it did, yeah, you know, there are ways of explaining to them, yeah, you know, why it, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. Uh, but look, it might be a little bit harder because with IVF, at least there is a clear individual need. Yeah, you said we don't need more children with a population of seven billion, but nonetheless, uh, individuals have a, in many cases, a quite desperate wish to have children, and that's understood and respected. And so, society has been quite quick to respect the you know, the desires or the needs, whatever you want to call them, of those parents, there would be less cases where reproductive cloning would be the only way to deal with an infertility issue. And so I think it would be slower to gain acceptance. You'd think that in many cases, if reproductive cloning were used, it would not to be to do with uh, an infertility issue, but for some other reason, perhaps just curiosity about how someone with my DNA would turn out in a very different environment. So I, I, I think there would be less pressure for the acceptance within a short period of time. H having said that, there would also be uh, issues uh, of infertility of you know, extreme male infertility or perhaps situations where say a, a lesbian couple might want to have a child who in a sense is a biological product of both you know that you, you could use cloning in a certain way that could accomplish that but that but of course that in itself might be something that would meet with a lot of social resistance right right well and then you know then you have, uh, you know, if someone is sterile in the first place, so they just decide to clone uh, themselves rather than, you know, trying some sort of fertilization, then you have to come into, okay, now what if the clone is also sterile? So now you have to alter at a genetic level to make sure that when the clone is born that it's not going to be sterile like the original parent, you know, and yeah. then we get into a whole new range of ethics. Now we're playing with, um, you know, basically just creating humans rather than letting them naturally you know occur in the first place well yes you are. I mean if if the reason for cloning in a particular case were uh, you know, a form of male infertility let's say you're cloning a, a man in this case and you create a you know a little person who's going to grow up having exactly the same fertility problem then yeah that might create a question about it but then you might say well Okay, but in this new world that that child will grow up in, where cloning might well be accepted, that particular kind of um, infertility might not be such a disability anyway. You know, is it really a disability? <laughs> yeah, g given the availability of the technology, but that that issue has been raised. Now, sure, what I think scares people is something you just said, which is that we're not letting something happen naturally, but we're we're creating something in a sense, you know, through a process of artifice. We're making a genetic choice. We're saying mm -hmm. what will come into existence here will be a child that will have you know, a particular identifiable genome. That does seem to frighten people. I'm not sure why it really should. But it, but it does seem to be something that frightens people. When you take out an element of that, you know, that chance aspect of a of a child coming into the world. Uh, now, even if you think there's something wrong with it, though, what real tangible harm does it do? Uh, and if it's not doing any tangible, yes, you know, significant harm to anybody. Well, why should the state really be involved in stopping it? You know, even if you think that there's something morally wrong about human beings having that sort of control, uh, is it really something the state should involve itself in? So I think so what it comes down to discussed in the book. Right. Well, I think what it comes down to, and I think the same could be said for really any, just about any aspect of human nature as it is. I think if we start playing around with um, designer children or you know de yeah. designing how humans are going to be then it's going to seem like we're imperfect 
I mean, and not to the aspect, yes, we, we know we're imperfect because nobody's perfect, but yeah, well, like, we like yeah. <laughs> but to more like, um, you know, as creatures, we're just, we're those of us who are already in existence and we're just, we were born the way we were and that's how it is, are going to be seen as, it's going to maybe make people feel like we're not good enough because now you can design a baby that's going to be uh, in whoever's eyes perfect. So now it's, I think it's more of an ego thing, really. It's, you oh, know, right. it, it's a potential of damaging egos, I guess. Yeah. Look, look, it's a hard one. If, if we created a whole new you know, strain of humanity, which uh, you know, was in certain senses superior, you know, now again, we're talking about <laughs> concepts here, what does superior mean? Right. But, uh, but, but, let, but let's imagine that that's straightforward, that we can say, well, these... You know, this strain of humanity we've created in some sense that's readily understandable, they're our cognitive and physical superiors and they're going to go off and create their own society apart from ours or they will become our overlords or something. I mean, that is a scary social prospect. I, I, I don't think that is entirely irrational. If that were the real prospect that we faced, I mean, I, I don't think that is the prospect that we face, but that's a hard judgment to make, right? I mean, re reality check says that's probably not going to happen or happen in any serious way, it, any more than currently happens from the availability of you know, superior nutrition or superior education or whatever. But, but look, if you made the judgment that that's actually going to be what takes place, then I think you've got a reason to say, well, hold on, let's slow down with these technologies. A, a lot of it becomes very imponderable. Um, Based upon what you think is a realistic um, prognosis for the you know, the human future, right. right? Well, and you know, going back to uh, free will and that, I think uh, you know, just I think, like I said, a lot of our issues just boil down to ego. You know, if it turns out that free will isn't exactly what we think it is, and everything that we do is all based on subconscious reactions to our environment, then how much control do we really have who, over? who we are and what we do, um, I think it's just, it's, I think it's all for the same reason that religious people are, you know, offended when you uh, question their religion, it's just, it's all ego, you know, I think we have a, yeah. like, an overblown view of who we are or, or what we are, and anytime something threatens that, it's, it's, uh, you know, kind of makes us react. Yeah, Freud had this thing that, you know, yeah, you've probably come across where he said, yeah, there are three great yeah, Copernican changes to the way we understand ourselves and our place in the world, and yeah, you know, the first one was Copernicus, um, where, who yeah you know, very powerfully argued for the heliocentric view of the universe rather than a geocentric view of the universe. So, so we're not the physical centre of the universe anymore. <laughs> and then Darwin shows that we are continuous with you know with other animals. We're not. You know, a, a special creation, but have evolved from ape-like creatures, and then Freud says, "And I'm the third one." <laughs> but he had a point here. You know, he was about showing a bit of ego. But but what he says is, you know, a, a great deal of our decision making is not conscious. So we're not in control of ourselves. A lot of it's, you know, all this stuff that goes on subconsciously. Now, much as a lot of Freud's specific views are in disrepute, that that general claim that Freud made, and and, and probably first. Yeah, you know, popularised and argued for very strongly is basically true. <laughs> so, so those are, uh, you know, someone came up with this expression, uh, hammer blows to the human ego. Well, they, they are kind of hammer blows to our view of ourselves in the world, and there will be more such blows from neuroscience and and, and elsewhere. But generally speaking, we are capable of absorbing these things and, and living with them. Oh, well, yeah. Sorry, I was taking over this, well, that was a conversation. Some <laughs> uh, no, a question that I did think of here. Um, you know, this is going a little bit back to the start, but also ties into the cloning subject. Uh, is there any films or books that you say that actually get it quite the whole issue quite right? Like, um, you know, that kind of spurt of cloning films you saw at the end of the nineties into the is there any you think are actually on the money with what they said? 
Look, I, I don't know that I'd send you off to watch any particular film to, yeah. get a, <laughs> to get a view of this. I mean, look, look, Gattaca is is a film worth seeing, yep. uh, because it it paints one of these nasty scenarios in a way that's reasonably plausible. Yeah, yeah, Gattaca. I, I guess you've probably seen it. It is about the situation where there are people who, for whatever reason, because their parents you know, had certain moral views or whatever, are born in a natural way, and you know, are, are the children or not? Yeah, you know, they're they're being selected uh, using it must be pre-implantation genetic diagnosis or some you know, futuristic version of it, and so they don't have all the sorts of you know, flaws. That you might expect would arise naturally, and and that and that does lead to, you know, to the oppression of the yeah you know, the invalids you know the the, the natural born children. So so the Gattaca scenario is one that is worth at least taking seriously. I don't think realistically that scenario is going to arise, but it, but you know to prevent it may take a certain amount of regulation. I'm not entirely against regulation in these areas, as I had I made clear before. Yeah, that that is a movie worth giving. Serious consideration too. Unlike all the movies that just use cloning as an excuse for you know, exotic adventures going on. Okay, uh, I would think that um, al al although the particular um, enhancements are probably not realistic, Nancy Cress's work, uh, starting with a book called Beggars in Spain, is very worthwhile reading. Uh, you know, as, as some science fictional. Speculation about all this. Okay, um, I think we'll go back. Uh, another one of Kitch's que questions that he left with us. He says, as improvements continue in robotics, including human abilities, right. would bi bioethics become more involved in this field? Well, yeah. Um, look, there's a whole lot of work by philosophers, ethicists, etc. in this whole area of computer ethics and robot ethics and how we should use robots. You know, should we use robots in, say, nursing homes? Uh, should we be... Should, are these robot toys? You know, these little robot dogs and so on, things that we really should be developing further or are there, there are dangers in that? I mean, all those kinds of issues, even apart from the old issues of the effective automation on industry and you know, em employment, uh, you know, which we've been talking about for many decades now. But, but yeah, there's a lot of work going on in these sorts of areas, and there do seem to be some serious issues there. I actually wrote a paper in you know, one of the peer-reviewed journals, because I think we should be writing for peer-reviewed journals as well, on, on this whole issue of, of robot toys and, uh, and and the more general issue about whether robotics and computerization is harming or potentially could harm our, our understanding of the truth that's going on around us. That, yeah, there is an argument that as these things become more and more lifelike, but without having genuine consciousness behind them, we could start finding ourselves responding to them in all sorts of ways as if they did actually have consciousness behind them when they don't, which means we're responding in a way that's deluded, right? That could become more and more ubiquitous. And that seems like it's a kind of moral problem. You know, do we want to live in a world where we're constantly, uh, consciously or, or maybe subconsciously, you know, responding to a whole lot of the stuff around us in ways that's not real? Now, I, I must say in my own article, I tended to pour a bit of cold water on that, that particular fear. But I don't think it's an entirely crazy fear to have. Uh, so, so yeah, a whole lot of stuff about robotics. You know, the the use of um, robots in a nursing situation. You get to the point where people are being deprived of human company to be given this sort of ersatz company from robots, uh, and and that's a very big program going on in Japan. Uh, you know, the, the possible use of robots in that sort of situation. Uh, the military applications of robots, right? Incredibly. Um, 
fraud issue at the moment uh, you know, with the use of drone weapons and so on and uh, presumably there will be more and more sophisticated generations of such weapons which will increasingly you know, perhaps give decisions even about killing people to um, yeah, to artificial intelligences. So yeah, well, I mean, whether you call it bioethics anymore, or what you call it, this 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 area of ethics, you know, will be important. Okay, um, Sheila, do you have anything there? Yeah, actually, I just recently saw a, like a video clip of uh, Japan's most recent uh, advancement, where there's a like a scientist sitting there talking to what is, I guess technically a robot but she's covered in uh, human form just it's incredible how far we've come already you know as, as far as robotics go um. right right and and increasingly so I mean Japan is really into this they, they have a, a major yeah kind of philosophical and strategic commitment to these sorts of programs uh, but they could take various forms and, and and some of those forms may be questionable <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's very certain. Um, you know, it, the uh, military applications obviously would be great. Yeah. Um, you know, it's saving human soldiers' lives. Uh, but again, I think we're a long way off from from that. Um, at this point, it would be uh, not really very cost effective to try and place. Uh, you know, even if we were ready to go at this point, I mean, how much would it cost to create just one robot? Um, so I, you know, it's it's going to be probably a couple of generations at least before we get to anything even remotely close. Mm -hmm. for Nonetheless, there's an issue here. Uh, uh, and look, don't get me wrong. I'm not one of the people who particularly crusades against these military applications of weaponry. I think they have to be thought through carefully. There may be advantages, there may be disadvantages, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Nonetheless, uh, issues do arise when we increasingly try to develop military systems that detach uh, people from you know, being you know, physically in the war zone and in danger. Now, clearly there are huge advantages to that. I mean, you know, if your um, personnel are sitting in the safety of your know, high-flying aircraft uh, or, or the safety of a ship offshore, or, or wherever it might be, or a military base, you know, well away from the actual war zone, and they're sending in weapons that you know are doing the damage without being a particular danger themselves. That's got a huge plus side to it, right. but it's also got downsides, and it can have unexpected effects. I mean, it, it, it sometimes turns out that the people who are controlling the, these kind of remote um, military devices, you know, suffer kinds of psychological trauma that you wouldn't expect. So, so even that has to be researched and, and on and on it goes. Now I don't claim to be any sort of expert in this field so I'm going to shut up about it in a minute <laughs> or I'll start saying things that you know, where I'm out of my depth. But, but there's a whole area of, you know, of medical research, you know, psychological research and a whole area of just reflecting about well do we think yeah, certain paths that we might take with the military are, are good or bad on balance, or, or you know, if there's no clear answer to that, yeah, you know, just what path, yeah, you know, should we be taking? Not just from a, you know, point of view of military efficacy, but what we're doing to our own people, what we're doing that might make war more likely, uh, yeah, and, and on and on it goes. So well, that's not really only helpful. that, but if you uh, remove the human element completely from war, then it becomes far too easy to just go to war. You know, if, if you oh, well, that is one of the concerns, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so you, you may be more and more tempted to solve problems in military ways if you have not only overwhelming military superiority, which the United States basically has now uh, with the collapse of the Soviet Union you know, 20 odd years ago, um, but not just overwhelming military superiority, but a kind of overwhelming military superiority that can uh, you know, reduce a lot of the risks to yourself of going to war. So, there, there, so there's an issue there. I mean, that said, obviously every nation has reason to jockey for military superiority, unless we <laughs> could somehow all agree, once and for all, that you know that war's not going to happen. So it's difficult. Um, it was just uh, this question was beginning to come up the way I was going, but do you think like, well, obviously not the Terminator as in the book, but something like that is that far off? Like, uh, you know, 
well, tissue and you know, robotics mixing together. Do you think that kind of technology is really that far away? Uh, I think it is a long way away, and, I, and I'm not sure in what circumstances you would really want to use that. I mean, in in the Terminator franchise, they, you know, you know Skynet, the evil computer which has you know, destroyed humanity, is is creating those Terminator robots. They're basically robots, but with the cyborg aspect, you have the human flesh over and so on, in order to be able to infiltrate the resistance, you have to pass themselves yeah. off as human. I don't know that we particularly want to do that. I, you know, there, I suppose there could be military application, there could be applications in nursing homes and so on, but I, but I think we'll have sufficiently lifelike robots for our purposes without doing that. Okay. Yeah, 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 for the purposes that are really likely to arise, which I think will be more the use of, of um, you know, advanced, highly lifelike robots in, say, nursing home environments. Okay. Um, do you have anything there, Sheila? No, go ahead. Right, we've got another one. I can't just questions. He did leave a whole <laughs> load of them for you, Russell. Um, he's saying, with, with advances in uh, meat products being made using tissue culture, uh, if this technology improves, would it still be eth ethical to eat meat from animals? <laughs> yeah, well, you might ask whether it's even ethical to eat meat from animals now, given the way that uh, yeah, a lot of these animals are factory farmed. Yeah, some of the conditions are horrendous. If it turns out that we have very easy substitutes for those animals, you, you might well ask, well, what's the point of continuing with the factory farms, right? So, so, so it would make it even harder to justify eating factory farmed meat. I mean, that said, I'm I'm not a vegetarian, let alone a vegan or whatever. But, but perhaps there's an argument that I should be um, not eating meat, or 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 eating, or being much more. What's the word I want? Stringent about what sort of meat I'm prepared to eat. I mean, I I do some things. You know, I, I make some efforts to eat. Uh, you know, genuinely free range uh, meat, but I don't make as much effort as possibly I should be right, already. I think your question is a good one because if there's even less justification for factory farming, there's even less justification for eating meat that comes from factory farms. Is there probably there be environmental benefits from, to, you know, like I say, growing meat from tissue samples that we could do that? It wouldn't be as much yeah, of Yeah, yeah. Okay, I wasn't even farming. thinking of the environmental side. I was just thinking of the welfare of animals side. Yeah. All right, Sheila, do you have anything there? Um, no, not really. Um, I guess <laughs> I'm not vegetarian either. And, you know, I, I think for the most part it's hard to, uh, without just absolutely re refusing to eat any meat or meat products or anything. I think it's virtually impossible at this point to avoid some sort of factory farm, you know, type of meat or uh, or animal products like dairy or, or whatever, you know, just because that's where the majority of our meat comes from. So I think it would it would definitely benefit us some to, uh, to figure out. That being said, um, I do like farming, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I I would much I would rather you know grow my own food than um, right. have to depend on a store or something to get it from. So yeah, I mean, look, there are I mean, there is a body of literature out there which will give you some some guidance as to what your options are if you're trying to avoid factory farming. Yeah, you know, that you you have some choices to eat meat that yeah you know, has been. Yeah, you know, the, the result of animals from more um, humane conditions. It, it, it requires effort. Mm -hmm. Now, once again, I put in some effort, but I have not been prepared to put in yeah you know, the huge amount of effort that arguably we should put in if we want to go on eating meat. You know, it, it's a it's a real issue. It, it's something that you might well quite rightly feel guilty about if you're not putting in quite a lot of effort. But are still eating meat. Yeah, leaving leaving aside even arguments that people will put about how you know, taking the lives of animals for ourselves, etc., etc., is morally wrong. I, I'm not even. 
buying into those sorts of arguments, and I don't particularly find those sorts of arguments impressive. But I, but I am concerned about animals that are you know, farmed under you know, very, very uh, harsh conditions. Yeah, there was that report that was just released from uh, re regarding DiGiorno Pizza. There, I, I guess they've dropped one of the, their their sources for their dairy products that they were getting. But there was a video released. They had uh, gone into one of their dairy producers' farms, and there was video footage of the the cows being abused. They were stabbed yeah. and and kicked, and you know, just all yeah. sorts of things. And I guess. You know, DiGiorno as a result has dropped that supplier, um, but again, it, you know, you drop one, there's ten more that are just like it. You know, so it's. I guess I can. My point is, I guess I can understand the need for something like that. Um, you know, in cases like that, where it's just it's hard to know unless you go in and investigate every single farm that's mass producing like that. It's hard to know what sort of conditions your food is is being raised in. Oh, that's sure. Or, or at least, yeah, do do a lot of research, network with people. You know, you, we're we're not helpless, but it's not a straightforward matter to to find these things out. Yeah. And and it's going to vary from country to country too. You know, the, the the typical way that certain animals are raised in one country, or maybe even one part of the US, for all I know. I can imagine even that could vary quite a lot. So that there would be a lot of work to be really stringent about this. But, you know, um, I'm, I'm, trying, that's what we've been talking about. I'm trying to think of the name of the book that Peter Singer co-authored a few years ago. The name of the book just won't come to me. But, but they, Singer, of course, is vegan, but, but they do go into quite a lot of detail about what your options are and what further research you can do to, you know, to find out more about your options. Now, they're realistic about the fact that a lot of people will not give up eating meat, but, right. but as, as they have, but, but they can do something. So, I mean, as I say, the name of the book won't come to me, but I, I'm sure listeners can easily track down the book I'm referring to if they, you know, if they wish to. Sure, sure, absolutely. Okay, uh, anything else? Oh, were you going to say something, Sheila? Nope. All right. Uh, okay, just to let everyone know, we're coming up just for ten minutes, the final ten minutes of the show. So if you do have any final questions, just fire them through in PM, or if you do want to call in, at the Skype contact, uh, throwing with logic. Uh, when I'm going to go back to one of your other books, uh, the Freedom from Religion and the Secular State book. Uh, so, what gave you the idea to write that book, and you know, what is it you set out in it? Okay. Look, what gave me the idea to write is that there's a whole lot of issues around that, that connect with the, you know, the role of religion, the social and political role of religion. And I thought it was worthwhile writing a book that ties all that up and gives it com some kind of theoretical unity. So, I mean, what are those issues? Well, they can be, but they can include things like the influence of religion in policy on, say, cloning and genetics and the sorts of things we're just talking about. But they also include things like the burqa. Now in, in Europe, as you know, uh, there are countries that actually banned the public wearing of the burqa. Right? That, that's not going to be an issue in a place like the United States, but it's a big issue in a place like France. Uh, you know, it comes up proposed from time to time in the UK, etc., etc. So, so there's a whole lot of issues about the political and social influence of religion and what freedom of religion really means. So the book is called Freedom of Religion and the Secular State and I try to nail down, well, what really is freedom of religion all about? And having nailed that down, what should we say about this whole range of issues? You know, the influence of religion on issues like abortion, the influence of religion on yeah, therapeutic cloning, stem cell research, all of those things, but also our freedom of speech. You know, often we find speech that's being banned because it offends the religious. Uh, do, does freedom of religion somehow entail that you have a right to go through life without being offended in the sense of your religion being criticised in a harsh way or blasphemed? All of those kind of issues, and yeah, you know, I thought it was necessary to try to come up with some kind of unified theory of it all. Yeah, 
Um, that makes it sound very, <laughs> very abstract, doesn't it? But but <laughs> but a lot of these issues really are you know, fraught, you know, practical issues right now. Yeah. Uh, so there was a question, and it's something I've come across, and it's when I've debated with American Christians, and they say freedom from religion doesn't include freedom of religion. How do you? Well, the other way around, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Fre freedom of religion doesn't include freedom from religion. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah, but how do you yeah, usually yeah. respond to that? Or have you ever well, come across that? Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, I mean, to go back to my own um, theoretical framework, what, what I think freedom of religion is fundamentally about is this idea that the state is secular. You know, that the state is not there to impose a religion on somebody or to persecute a religion that it doesn't like. Right? And that does include freedom from religion. If you are not religious at all, the state should not be imposing a religion on you. If you're, say, Catholic and the state's preferred religion is, I don't know, some Protestant faith, the state should not be imposing that Protestant uh, faith on you. So the state should not be imposing its favourite religion and nor should it be imposing irreligion. You know, it, it should not be imposing atheism either. You, you should be able to go on um, without a state-favoured view on these questions about the, the supernatural. That's, that's what freedom of religion is really all about. And if the state is therefore not persecuting you or imposing a religion that's alien to you, you will be able to uh, carry on with your own religion if you have one. Or you'll be able to carry on, yeah, not, um, you know, being religious or leading a religious way of life. Th therefore, from first principles, yes, freedom of religion does include freedom from religion. Okay, um, Sheila, do you have anything to add there? Uh, no, I just <laughs> I got into a conversation just recently, um, just commenting on something, and and uh, you know Thea subjected to it using the same the exact same argument. So, just I completely understand what you're getting at there. <laughs> yeah. So would you say the whole, you know, how it more and more heap people, you know, blasphemy laws is that kind of the biggest challenge to secularism kind of worldwide right now? Because I do see a huge push. For you know, universal blasphemy laws and things like that. Yeah, look, I think that has receded a little bit at the level of the United Nations. It was a matter of great concern uh, not very long ago, and it will keep coming up. So, so yes, this this idea that we should not be blaspheming, you know, prophets or um, religious symbols. We, we yeah, the we shouldn't be making cartoons that satirise Muhammad. All of that kind of stuff has been a, a huge issue in recent years and it will continue to come back. That is a real danger to our freedom of speech, right? The question, how does freedom of religion relate to freedom of speech? I say they're totally compatible with each other because to me freedom of religion means the state will not persecute you for your religion or impose a religion on you. But if a private individual is mocking Muhammad, that's not the state doing anything. Uh, and for, so freedom of religion does not mean that private individuals must stop um, criticizing your religion or, or satirizing your religion. It means that the state will not um, prevent you from carrying out a religion. And even that's limited. Because say your religion, you know, let, let's take a really extreme example, say your religion required human sacrifice, can the state prevent you exercising that aspect of your religion? Well, yes, it can. But, but it would do so in a way that does not single out your religion. It would do so simply by having a law forbidding murder. That law would be a, you know, a broad general law that applies to anyone who wants to commit murder for any reason. It's a so-called neutral law of general applicability or general application. And it catches people who want to commit murders for religious reasons and for non-religious reasons. The state can do that. What, what the state would not be able to do is say, well, we're fine with murder. Uh, We'll have no law against murder, but we don't like this Aztec religion over here, so we will ban this particular kind of murder. 
Well, I mean, that would be just singling out a religion for persecution. That neutral laws of general applicability that happen to affect religion, I think, generally speaking, they're fine. Yeah, now, now, there's then an argument, well, are there maybe some secular reasons to give exemptions from some of those laws in some circumstances? And there may be, but, but as a starting point, neutral, generally applicable laws are fine, even if they do have effects on some religion. Yeah, you know, you, you just want some good secular reason to having that law. Okay, uh, she, we're coming up for five minutes, so I'll let you have another question, Sheila. Um, if you do. Okay. <laughs> I actually, I think most of my stuff got covered already. So, if you've got anything else from from Kitch, go ahead. Uh, I think that's the end of my uh, Kitch's questions. So, I'll just double check there. Yes, it is. Um, so I suppose uh, did we cover the new book? So maybe we could talk like you know what's in the new book. What's okay? Well, well, we we can talk about a few things to do with what I'm doing at the moment, if you like. You know, the the new book, which is from MIT Press, has a 2014 um, copyright date on it. So you won't necessarily see it in the shops for a while yet. But these dates are always a bit fuzzy, and Amazon is advertising that there's copies in stock. So it is just out now. You said in the last few weeks, well, it's really the last few days right. that it seems to be coming in stock at Amazon. Uh, it, it is about the regulation, the, you know, the, the political response, the political and legal response to the technologies of genetic, ha uh, genetic choice, which we were talking about earlier, this concept that you might be able to choose the genome of what human beings come into existence, either through reproductive cloning or through pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, where you actually you know, examine the genome of you know, embryos in the test tube, to put it that way, or you know, other technologies like um, genetic engineering technologies. How should we respond politically to those sorts of technologies? And I argue that we have panicked in our political response to those technologies. That's what that book is really all about. The book, though, that, I've, that I'm actually working on at the moment uh, that, that is a book that I'm co-editing with my friend Damien Broderick. Uh, Damien and I have just uh, turned in the manuscript to Wiley Blackwell of our new book, which is called Intelligence Unbound. And that's a book about machine intelligence. Okay. We're, we're looking at the prospect of you know, mind uploading, as it's called. You know, could you somehow upload your personality to some kind of advanced computer system? The possibility of uh, advanced computer systems that are themselves conscious, so you know, not just intelligent, but, you know, but fully um, minds in the sense that, that we are minds. And I, it's going to be the definitive book on that in a sense because we have people who are very sceptical, we have people who are very gung-ho, we've got a whole range of contributors and they are high profile people writing about those topics. So people like the leading humanist uh, so the leading transhumanist figures such as Max Moore, Natasha Vita Moore, James Hughes, Anders Sandberg are in the book, but also people who are very sceptical like Massimo Piliushi who won't countenance any of this stuff and puts his argument, uh, people who are scientists, people who are philosophers, people from different schools of philosophy. So that's the new book that should be out by about this time next year if all goes well. We're currently just going through the preliminary work on that with Wiley Blackwell having submitted the manuscript a couple of weeks ago. So that's what I'm actually most excited about at the moment, but you, the readers, won't see that for quite a while yet. It's coming through the pipeline. There was one final completely off-topic question from Paul Sanderson. Um, he's asking, as a humble Englishman, your opinion on the ashes. <laughs> Well, I, I think England's in a little bit of trouble at the moment. Yeah. Put it that way. He said he, he, said he was which, willing... Which is a bit of a relief after what happened last time when our blokes went to England. Yeah, he's saying it's only fair to let the Aussies have some bragging rights. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, I think, I think it's going to go our way this time. All right. Uh, so that's, uh, we're just coming up for the last minute. So thank you very, very much, Russell. It's been Pleasure. Fa it's been fascinating. Lots of great topics um, covered. So, Sheila, your final words. Sheila. Oh, sure thing. Uh, 
I guess, um, uh, you know, outside of being here on Trolling with Logic, I'm also on A News. Um, so you can find me there. You can follow me at, at on Twitter at Sheila Blackadder. Um, you can find me on Facebook. Uh, message me. You know, I'm open to talking to anyone. I also have a new project I'm working on. I'll be releasing sometime in the next couple of days. So, um, you know, I guess watch all of those places yeah. for information about that. Um, or you can find me on my Facebook page, Femin Atheist. Okay, and just a quick reminder, I'm also on another podcast called The Antimatter Bandits. We do fan commentaries on various science fiction and action films. We recorded last night, and we did some very early Star Trek Next Generation, and it wasn't enjoyable at all. But, um, <laughs> yeah, that's coming up, and we'll be back next week. We're doing one of our famous live ponages, our live on-air rebuttals to kind of various, so I would say, more out there kind of creationist videos, and we're looking at the Health Ranger Mike Adams next week, so... <laughs> Be sure to tune in. Yeah, you know that. <laughs> so again, yeah, a very big fun. thank you to our guests, and also uh, thank you very much, Russell, for getting up so early for this. And thank you, guys. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Okay. Uh, good night, everyone, yeah. and have a good rest of your Sunday if you're in Russell's neck of the woods, and rest of the weekend to everyone else. Have a good, have a good one. All right. And we're off the air. Okay. Thanks very much, Rob. Well, thanks again, guys. That was well, writing a novel. I, uh, but, but what I cannot be doing is writing some work of fiction while at the same time on on a uh, an immersive non-fiction project. They are very just very different zones. But yeah, they both they both have each has a kind of rigor of its own. Yeah. Um, and what? How did the feedback to the two compare? Like say, like your philosophical peers compared to Terminator fans? Right? <laughs> they well, it's the only thing I did at this much overlap. Yeah. Uh, look, you don't necessarily get a huge lot of feedback from either, in, in a way. I mean, unless you're Neil Gaiman or somebody, you're not getting constant feedback from fans. You know, a, a lot of people write fiction, and it doesn't reach a vast audience. The Terminator books did actually reach quite a large audience, but they didn't receive huge numbers of reviews. If you went to Amazon, you'd find there's quite a few reviews there, and they tended to be quite favourable. Right. Uh, I, I received a certain amount of fan mail, which is nice. <laughs> uh, I still get the occasional inquiry about the Terminator books. But yeah, it's not like you're receiving you know, an enormous amount of feedback unless you become a real celebrity author. Okay. With something like you know, Fifty Great Myths About Atheism, you know, so it's so a book that's aimed at at this kind of movement. Yeah, you know, to some extent, it's aimed at that movement. Yeah, you do get a fair bit of feedback. You find yourself caught up in debates. Um, and again, I suppose the feedback that I have had for that book and for uh, Fifty Voices of Disbelief, the book that Ujo Shuklank and I edited a few years ago, that feedback's been pretty positive. But again, it's not as if there's been some huge number of reviews. You know, there's been quite a few reviews on Amazon by now, 50 Voices of Disbelief, which came out in 2009. Uh, and again, that's been pretty favourable. Uh, it's opened doors. But, you know, not a lot of reviews in newspapers, some in, some in academic journals, actually. Um, and they've generally been pretty favourable. So I don't know how you do that comparison. All right. So. But... but <laughs> You know, that, that, I'm, I'm giving you a very long answer. But, yeah, all right. But, you know, it, it, it's, it's complicated. But you do get a certain amount of feedback. Unfortunately, the, the feedback I've had has tended to be pretty favourable so far. Tended to be. I could give you some stories all right. uh, that go against that tendency. All right, I'll hand over back over to Sheila there. What's been your, uh, I guess, your more favourite uh, genre to kind of write in? Are you enjoying doing the more uh, non fiction? Uh, reality-based sort of stuff, or or do you really enjoy yeah. doing the sci-fi stuff better? I do feel like uh, what I'm doing now is what I should be doing. I, I you know, I said to someone that I, I feel like I've been studying all my life to write the books I'm currently writing, <laughs> and, and and I'm finally in a position where I can do them. You know, I've, I've finally built up you know, enough of a reputation and enough. Um, Financial independence, because these books don't make huge amounts of money. Right. Yeah, you know, to be able to do this, uh, 
this sort of technology could be used to create you know, human babies, right? Now, I thought all of that was misplaced, not, not only because it might have turned out to be difficult to do it, which we didn't necessarily know at that time, but that did turn out to be the case, but there just seemed to be, to be no real basis in our ordinary understanding of you know, what sort of things we should be fearing, what sort of things we should be regulating by law. So there should be no basis for this kind of repugnance, fear, the sort of legal prohibitions that were put in place and so on. It, it seemed to me that what we were seeing here was a, a kind of challenge to our normal ideas of liberal tolerance and we were failing that challenge. You know, we were going down this route of moral panic and knee-jerk legislation instead. So that fits into a, you know, a much wider interest that I have in in politics, in political philosophy, political theory. But I am also interested in the human future. I've, I've for example, always been an avid reader of, of science fiction. I've written some science fiction professionally. So that that kind of area at the intersection of bioethics and philosophy of law and political philosophy, you know, it was of interest to me because a whole lot of my interests converged in that area. Do you find a lot of, uh, oh, like a lot of the science fiction is uh, even loosely based somewhat in reality when it comes to the uh, the ethics of... Um... Uh, look, it, it varies enormously. I mean, there are some serious works that, you know, that, that deal with this, this kind of issue in a way that I think is very you know, useful and, and thought-provoking. We have to remember, though, that a lot of science fiction is really an excuse for you know, exotic adventures in, you know, in exotic locales in space and, and time. So, so a lot of science fiction, you, you might say, can't be taken all that seriously, you know, even as a literature of ideas. But, but the overall genre, yes, it is a literature of ideas. You know, it, it buzzes with intellectual excitement. I'm, I'm talking here more of the written science fiction rather than you know, cinema or, or television. But yeah, you know, there, there is a literature of ideas there, and sure, um, some of it is useful. But but this this set of issues does merit yeah you know, some hard nosed I don't know yeah skeptical scrutiny. Skeptical in the sense of being skeptical about these these sort of knee jerk reactions, these these highly emotional reactions that we often see. Well, right, and I I find that um, a lot of times Hollywood will kind of contribute to that. You know, when the when the cloning yeah. issue was big, we had movies like The Six Day raising issues about uh, yeah. you know yeah. morals uh, of cloning people and you know and stuff like that. So, and, and movies like that often seem to me to just fear mongering. You know, I mean, I mean that was an amusing movie, <laughs> and at the end <laughs> they, they they actually clone the dog at the end, don't they? I, I'm trying to remember how that movie ends up, yeah. but but that's true. Out. It's it's partly an excuse for yeah. You know, and good evening, everyone. Well, or good morning, depending on where you are. Welcome <laughs> to Trolling World Logic. It's 7 p.m. in the UK, and I think it's 6 a.m. with our guest right now. So, in advance, a very big thank you for him to getting up so early for this. Uh, so we're a <laughs> weekly, weekly uh, secular skeptic show and broadcasting here on Google Hangouts. Uh, just a few quick announcements. You can call in at any time. Just send us a Skype contact request to Throning Will Logic, a little PM with a, just your question, and we'll add you on in due course. Also, the show is recorded and uploaded later, so if you call in, please bear in mind you're granting us permission to use your likeness, so please no funny legal stuff when the show is uploaded. Also, the recording of this show is public domain, so feel free to copy, share, distribute, and spread it around any way you want, just as long as you link back to us as a courtesy. And with me today is a very much reduced panel, so I'll introduce my one and only co-host, Sheila. Welcome. Thanks, Cal. Glad to be here again. No problem. So I'll quickly introduce our guest today. He is an Australian writer, philosopher, critic, um, currently based in Newcastle, and I'm not too sure what state that's in, so please, uh, apologies for that. Uh, you'll probably know him from his books, uh, Freedom from Religion, The Secular State, 50 Greatest, and The 50 Greatest Myths About Atheism, and he has just, uh, I, just I think just weeks ago, released a new book called Humanity Enhanced, Genetic Choice and the Challenge for Liberal Democracies, 
and I think also holds uh, just recently got a PhD in bioethics. So a man of many talents. Please welcome Russell Blackford to the show. <laughs> Thanks, Cal. Um, for your information, Newcastle is in New South Wales. It's ah, just right. a little bit north of Sydney. All right, sure. Uh, yeah, anyway. So I think, Take as is the custom, um, Sheila seems to be the, the best with all the introductory <laughs> questions. So, as always, I'll hand over to Sheila to get us started. Oh, okay. Um, I guess uh, since bioethics seems to be what we're talking about today, how did you get uh, interested in, in that sort of a field? Uh, look, I've had an interest in the, you know, the human future for a very long time. The PhD, strictly speaking, is actually in philosophy, not in bioethics. It's really uh, partly philosophical bioethics, but partly philosophy of law. And what particularly interested me in the particular case of the PhD, leaving aside the larger issues of bioethics, was what I saw as a moral panic about the issues that it deals with, you know, when um, the announcement was made in the journal Nature in early 1997 about the cloning of Dolly the Sheep, if you recall, there was an enormous amount of discussion in the public sphere, uh, a great deal of which was, you know, repugnance, horror, fear that there uh, was some weird adventure going on. Um, <laughs> Partly, it's the, the sort of fear-mongering going on. I guess you don't take a movie like that too seriously, but the cumulative impact of a lot of movies like that is to add to that general climate of fear, which you know, I'm, I'm obviously speaking against. Right. Do you uh, see us going in a direction of, uh, you know, we were talking about Dolly and cloning before, do you see that being a, a legitimate possibility for future? Oh, in theory, I, 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 I say in the book that we need to have a reality check with a lot of this stuff. You know, the, the fact is that it has proven very difficult to clone primates. You know, back in 1997, the sky seemed to be the limit, but what is it now, 16, well, since Stoli was actually cloned, um, 17 years later, right? Yeah. And we're still not very far advanced towards human reproductive cloning and there's no real prospect of it on the horizon. So reality check is pretty important. Let, let's see you know, what kind of pace of change we're really talking about. Now, now all that said, there are uses of you know, the somatic cell nuclear transfer technique, the technique used to create Dolly, you know, which could be highly beneficial not in creating babies but in creating, creating therapies, you know, researching um, you know, medical issues. Yes, we're talking here about so-called therapeutic cloning as opposed to reproductive cloning. And that is potentially very useful. I mean, if, if you could clone uh, you know, organs which match the genome of the patient, so there's you know, no issue about tissue rejection, you know, that is a great medical breakthrough. And that kind of research, I think, is very important. There's been a you know, backlash even against that kind of research and where it is allowed at all, uh, it's allowed only with very stringent regulation because of the fear that surrounds this whole set of issues. Well, yeah, people are freaking out about cloning fruit. <laughs> so, oh, okay. you know, well, <laughs> something we've been doing for a very long time. Right, right. So, yeah, I, I think... Uh, I, I guess it's I, it doesn't really make any sense, but it's understandable that people would freak out about cloning specific organs and stuff like that. I guess. Yeah. Well, and there's also the whole thing about the rights of the embryo. You know, you this this kind of research is going to you know re require destroying embryos. A lot of people think that embryos are sacred because they're yeah you know, they they possess human dignity or something. Yeah, you know, they're <laughs> they like little human beings, even though they they obviously don't possess consciousness or, or or anything like that, or personhood in the sense of having some kind of sense of themselves. Right. But but, but nonetheless, there is this view that they possess some kind of enormous moral worth and must not be damaged or or destroyed. Or you know, you, you know, if you do that, you know, you know, if you deliberately destroy even a tiny eight cell. Uh, embryo, then you're doing something that's morally very wrong. 
Uh, and, and that'll come across often from religious morality, but not, not just from religious morality. You know, a, a lot of people do, even from some kind of point of view that they claim is secular, think that human life, even in that form, has a kind of you know, sanctity that, you know, that, that you mustn't violate. So a whole lot of issues get caught up with this. You know, religious morality, just fears about the future, fears about tampering you know, with the, you know, the order of nature. And it becomes a very emotional debate and leads to a lot of, I, I think, bad and um, you know, knee-jerk public policy. Um, I've got a question. It's a little bit off track, and it's just that you know I had a look through your bibliography, and I saw that you did uh, tie-in books for the Terminator franchise. I did, yeah. Yeah. Um, I know that it's going to sound like a little bit of a bizarre question, but well, how did that compare to like writing a scientific paper? Because as I understand, like I've spoken to some authors, she's done expanded universe, and like it's yeah. very strict set of rules, and the feedback can be quite uh, I don't know vociferous. I mean, was there a similarity? Did you find? Uh, look, it's a very different experience writing yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, you, you're right that there's a kind of rigour about it. Yeah. Uh, I prepared a, you know, a, a pitch, a detailed prospectus of the three books, and I went deeply into the way the two movies at that time it was, and, and um, Terminator 3 hadn't yet come out at that point, but I went deeply into how those worked, the time travel theory, and you know, how you could make sense of the two movies, which seemed to run with different theories about how how time travel works, you know, what might happen afterwards, given that kind of rationalisation, etc., etc. So there is a kind of rigour, and I, I watched... Oh, both movies, yeah, quite a few times. Terminator 2, to which the three books were a direct sequel, I studied very, very closely. Yes. So, yes, there's a rigour to it, but the way of writing, for me, is very, very different. Yes. If I'm writing fiction, I am writing through the characters. You know, I'm immersed in the sensorium, the thoughts, the you know, what's seen, what's heard, you know, by the viewpoint character that I'm using and it's a it's it's a funny thing to explain to someone who hasn't sort of written fiction at a professional level how you you know are taught to do it or teach yourself to do it uh, it, it is a, a kind of immersion in the characters that you're creating and using in that way that is a very different thing from writing something like a philosophical yeah. paper yeah you know, that has a rigor of course but it, it's I just find it's a very different mental zone to be in, and I've said often that I cannot be doing both at the same time. You know, I can be juggling more than one um, you know, a philosophical project. I can maybe even be writing a short story while I'm